Terrific. So good morning from Princeton. And on behalf of the Gilbert Lecture Series, welcome to this special event with Tony Towns Whitley of the great class of 1985 in conversation with Professor Ruha Benjamin. Just a couple of quick points before the program gets underway. Uh, first, we're anticipating about 30 to 40 minutes of discussion between our speakers, after which we'll take questions from the audience. If you're tuning into this event live, uh, whatever platform you're on, you can get us your questions by typing them in the comments section uh, at any time before or uh, during the Q&A period, the earlier the better really. Uh, if you prefer, you may send an email to gilbertlectures at princeton.edu. And uh, thank you in advance for taking the opportunity to pose questions. Um, now, to introduce our speakers, and I'll, I'll keep this as brief as possible so we can maximize conversation time, uh, I'll begin with uh, Professor Benjamin. Um, Ruha Benjamin is Professor of African American Studies at Princeton and is associated faculty in our Department of Sociology, uh, the Center for Inter Information Technology Policy, the Center for Health and Wellbeing, the Program on History of Science, and the Program on uh, Gender and Sexuality Studies. Professor Benjamin studies science, medicine, and technology and their relationship to race and gender, knowledge, and power. Professor Benjamin is also the founding director of the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab that is working to retool data for justice from issues of housing to policing uh, to health and environmental justice and more. Uh, you can learn much more about Professor Benjamin, including her multiple books and writings on issues of technology and society. You can find more information about the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab by visiting her website at ruhabenjamin.com. Uh, now to Tony Towns Whitley, great class of 1985. As president of US regulated industries at Microsoft, Tony is one of the executives, uh, is one of the executives, uh, 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 most important executives, not only at Microsoft, uh, but also in the technology industry. Uh, service has always been integral in Tony's life. She's the daughter of a school principal and an army officer. At Princeton, she studied in the School of Public and International Affairs. After Princeton, she joined the Peace Corps, serving as a teacher in Gabon for three years, and has continued to live a life of service throughout her career in government and the tech sector. A quick search online will reveal to you the multitude of service roles Tony holds on both corporate and nonprofit advisory boards, including here at Princeton with our Faith and Work Initiative in the Keller Center. Uh, additionally, she serves the Thurgood Marshall College Fund, the Partnership for Public Service, the United Way Worldwide, the Women's Center of Northern Virginia, and more. She's a past president and chair of Women in Technology, and at Microsoft has helped launch, launch uh, the Athena Alliance, which prepares women, prepares women for uh, corporate board roles, and uh, Gender Fair, which rates companies on their fairness practices. Uh, searching Tony online will also reveal the even more abundant appearances Tony has made in speaking roles on issues of equity, inclusion and representation, and on technology and society. So, Tony and Professor Benjamin, the Gilbert Lectures, is thrilled to have you both with us today to discuss this important topic of equity, ethics, and technology. And uh, Professor Benjamin, uh, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for that wonderful introduction to all the organizers of the lecture. Thank you for everyone behind the scenes and for those tuning in who are rejoining us um, after we had a little tech glitch the first time. Thank you for your patience. Uh, so, Tony, it's such an honor to be in conversation with you today. You lead U.S. regulated industries from Microsoft where you have responsibility for driving sales strategy and digital transformation for, pu for public sector and corporate customers in four areas, healthcare and life sciences, federal, state, and local government, education, and financial services and insurance. These are all sectors that were and are still severely impacted by the pandemic. I understand that Microsoft's role in supporting these sectors was principally in triage of the crisis, providing tools to automate as many functions as possible or to facilitate online communications and provide other tools to respond to the massive increase in the needs of these sectors constituents. 
Given your close relationship and deep insights into these sectors, would you share what you've observed of the disproportionate impacts of the pandemic? Absolutely. First, let me say thank you, Professor Benjamin. And it is always wonderful to be in the in the um, presence of and back in relationship with a university that was so important and foundational to my own development. And I'm so thankful for the role that all of you are playing in educating not only this generation, but future generations. So thank you. Your work and the work of, uh, of all of Princeton is just still probably the most uh, impactful that I see across the US and across the globe. And it's, it's just phenomenal, so thank you. Uh, another call out, because I know they're on the line and listening is to the Faith and Work Initiative, Dr. David Miller sitting in the Keller Center at, at Princeton. It's just wonderful to learn the work that we're doing in integrating, if you will, multiple disciplines around uh, the work that we do and what will be, quite frankly, I think one of the most critical conversations going forward in the new normal of how we work how we make decisions uh, of the technology that underpins the work that we do. But let me get specifically to your question. I have the opportunity and I would argue the blessing of sitting across sectors that have been on the front lines uh, over the last 18 months of redefining uh, how we continue operations of a government, how we serve in a virtual capacity, a pandemic ridden uh, society, uh, how we understand the infusion of capital into markets when the financial institutions themselves are in a continuity of operations mode because they too are remote, how we truly understand across education, K-12 and higher ed, the true disparities that exist across our country when we talk about access, uh, when we talk about content, when we talk about capability and competency of educators at all levels throughout this country. We have had a lab experiment of all experiments over the last 18 months. And I happen to be able to sit across the sectors that have been, I would argue, on the front lines. Our CEO, Satya Nadella, calls it being digital first responders, not, not the first in, but those who are trying to keep the systems, uh, the, the data flow, uh, the workflow, the continuity of operations in place while we address these. So beyond even triage to structurally being able to underpin uh, this country moving forward, there's been a, a huge role that tech has played. What are some of the learnings? You asked the question. Broadly, the learnings uh, have been in multiple categories around the role of platforms in technology. We've learned across sectors how important it is to have robust and secure platforms to do work. We've learned about what it is to operate in a cloud environment that quite frankly, uh, while different sectors are at different levels of maturity of moving into cloud-based computing and cloud-based uh, cloud migration support for their operation, those organizations and companies that were further along uh, we're able to move in more nimble ways during this last 18 months. We're able to quickly adopt new technologies and predictive capabilities that were needed to underpin. We, we've learned a lot about digital skilling that goes way beyond IT. And if there's anything that's been particularly important, I'll give a couple of examples in a moment of what it is to get beyond throwing devices at a problem, no matter what the device is, form factors at a problem versus understanding what it is to build digi digital fluency and how, it, how disproportionate that has been in this country by race, by socioeconomic class, by gender in many ways. And it isn't, again, not just getting a device in the hands of, uh, if you will, diverse individuals. It is about the underpinning of digital fluency, knowing what to do with that device, how to use that device, knowing the dangers of that device, or quite frankly, of the connections and ecosystem. Uh, we've learned about the continuity of collaboration. Um, and we've learned that probably most notably in healthcare with examples uh, like I could highlight of St. Luke's Medical uh, Network, which is a, about a million network um, uh, across two states, uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Uh, this, these networks had no telehealth capability, none. Uh, we're all physical brick and mortar. And what happens when you go from zero to having to do 5,000 televisits in a day, which is what happened at the heat of the pandemic to St. Luke's and many others. 
you're talking about going from being able to use knowledge workers in your back office to support clinicians in your front line, right? Clinicians, nurses, doctors, technicians, radiologists, and using this capability, the data flow to start to change a patient experience, chart to create a telehealth. But again, the disparity, the minute you introduce telehealth, it then exposes what does access look like? Uh, what does capability look like? What does the competency model for telehealth look like? And again, it follows the same pattern of disproportionately not as positive an impact for communities of color and communities, poor communities around this country. Um, we will say that leveraging the power of data and AI has never been more, uh, more evident. Um, while there are many concerns that we're going to talk about during our time together around the technology of artificial intelligence, uh, I will say to you that the use of data and AI, and AI has been up exponentially up through these last 18 months. And so the need for us to be urgent and intentional about understanding the implications of that use should also be in parallel with what we see as this growing data and AI sector. Um, and finally, obviously, everyone knows security runs at the core. I'm in highly regulated industries by definition. This is a $16 billion business for Microsoft. But fundamentally, this is about understanding the kinds of security, in inbuilt security, the zero trust architectures that are a new way to look at technology, to really understand identity and access and being able to assume that nothing is secure and you build up to a level of security. All of that has been, across sectors, has been sort of the key findings that we've had. A couple of just specific examples. I'll just go to uh, maybe, I mentioned healthcare previously, but I'd like to go to education and maybe the state and local government as just two examples of where the disparities have become quite, quite evident, uh, in fact, possibly exacerbated through uh, these last 18 months and quite frankly, through the evolution of technology. You know, it, it comes down to Professor Benjamin, the conundrum, and we have a number of them in tech. We have a number of them. If you, if you think about the concern about the disintermediation of jobs, the exacerbation, the exacerbating effect of socioeconomic divides. According to the Brookings Institute, I believe uh, it, it speaks to in a recent study that tech increases earning potential, but it also creates further wage dispersion across occupations. And so this spread of digital technology has empowered some, but it's also quite frankly divided and further divided others. I remember the old World Economic Forum study uh, back three years ago, which said um, for every single new digital job that was created, five traditional jobs for men around the world would be eliminated. But for women, it was a one to 20 because they were, if you will, disproportionately represented in labor categories that were ripe for this automation and for infusion of, of new technology. So we've got this conundrum of tech being good, if you, excuse me, good and economically um, impactful, and yet tech also being dividing, uh, uh, divisive, if you will, and also having an impact possibly on uh, marginalized individuals. Um, that's why I mentioned for the education sector, one of the toughest things, quite frankly, uh, for me going through this time with my team was watching and learning the deep divides across K through 12 education in this country. The United States was a petri dish of uh, access, lack of access, lack of fluency, lack of economic investment, uh, just inability, broadband, all kinds of things that showed that not only do we have uh, divisive and quite frankly, unequal educational systems, which I think is not new for anyone, but the technology actually was like a, uh, used to do a fluoride rinse in my generation of your teeth and you'd see red spots wherever there was, you had a problem, how that was a fluoride rinse for this country. And to be quite honest, we had to learn that getting beyond, again, devices to answer the problem, even state of the art devices, Shelby County, perfect example, Shelby County, um, Tennessee, which uh, encases Memphis, Tennessee. This is a county that 
was dealing with very basic challenges on literacy. Third graders, the majority of third graders not passing uh, the basic literacy exam. And, and they bought 95,000 Surface devices. For us, That's a they bought state-of-the-art devices under a grant through Shelby County. And yet it wasn't enough to drop Surface devices. Here's what we had to do. And we had to learn about this. We had to learn that we had to engage teachers, administrators, parents. Now parents are becoming teachers during the pandemic. We had to, quite frankly, shut down the Microsoft retail stores, put all the help desks for the retail stores, make them the help desk for parents and schools within Shelby County. Parents had to learn about internet safety. Parents started to had to learn about how to use these digital tools with their student with their children. And then sometimes they used it for their own, their own career purposes. And then all of a sudden we assigned a CIO, if you will, a chief information officer as an ambassador to each school and each community. It wasn't just the tech, it's what goes around the tech that's going to, if you will, rebalance a playing field. And that was one of our, our major learnings in the education field. But trust me, given I work across all of these sectors, I could, I could go all day about some of the learnings. I know we have some other questions to get to, but I think the key takeaway is that across these sectors, there were different needs and the role that technology played. The conundrum still exists. The conundrum of the positive and negative implications of technology, particularly on, on communities of color. Thank you, thank you, Tony. And in many ways, you, you began responding to my second question about um, how this moment has revealed more about these discriminatory dynamics. So I'm gonna skip that, but feel free to uh, touch on it in your further reflections. So I want to just acknowledge that you have lived a life of service and at Microsoft, you've continued to be thoughtful about the deployment of technology for the greatest good. So what is the process that a corporation like Microsoft goes through to establish principles and practices that define what it means to be responsible and to determine what even is the greatest good? And can you have any say in the end use of the tools that you provide? No, it's, it's a phenomenal question because it, it points to the accountability as well as the opportunity to speak to uh, the role of technology and what, what is a company? There, what is a large tech company truly responsible for? What should it be focused on? How does it create a framework for building technology in a more responsible way? When I think about Microsoft, and, and let me just start with this because I say this pretty consistently when I speak. The key, the key here is that all of tech, whether it's Microsoft, other companies, that, you have to build your framework before, if you will, the storm hits. If you're waiting for some regulatory moment to happen, you are very far in delay of what needs to be in place in the building of technology. It's got to be done in a thoughtful way, in an interdisciplinary way, in an inclusive way. You've got to be able to set practice principles that can then be operationalized to practices and how you build, sell, deploy, maintain, and support technology. At Microsoft, our approach really um, is based on a set of principles. We have principles, particularly for artificial intelligence, fairness, reliability, safety, and privacy, security, inclusiveness, transparency, and accountability. Now, to be fair, many of those principles have grown. That, that wasn't a static list. If we started, I would say most tech companies start with these issues of reliability, safety, privacy, and security because those are compliance issues. Those are transparency issues that are required to work in tech by, by different regulatory bodies. What we've added to that conversation is fairness, is, is full accountability, is transparent inclusiveness. That's a new ad for most tech companies to understand the implications of the technology they build in new dimensions that are coming quite frankly from the new demands of society, the new demands of our citizenry and quite frankly, our customer base. So how do you then turn the principle into the practice? So when we adopted the set of AI principles, we had to then figure out how do we operationalize those? And so putting principles into practice was a combination of rules, of standards, of training, of tools and processes that would help every one of our 150,000 employees integrate 
responsible AI into their daily work. The idea isn't to have, I always get concerned when someone says I have an AI team for ethics and that's what they do. If that's what they do, what does the rest of your team do? Because at the end of the day, this has got to be an embedded way of thinking. So for us, we started initially with a set of principles. We then started to embed those principles into specific practices and then making sure that we had all of the individuals in the company aware of with tool sets that they could use if they were in the building or deploying of AI to ensure that we were growing down the path of understanding more and more about the sensitive uses of this kind of technology. So it's really been a four part kind of system. First, we've got uh, what I'll call our various boards, our AI board. I had a chance to sit on the sensitive use committee these are boards that report directly up to the CEO. I had the opportunity to look at technology and make decisions on specific cases with a set of uh, lawyers, uh, ethicists, uh, philosophers, social scientists, also technologists, engineers in an interdisciplinary way to say, is the technology mature enough? Do we trust the hands that the technology is in? Are we going to approve the deployment of this technology? Does it violate any form of human right? Is it an infringement on personal freedom? Does it deny access or service to a group? What is the, quite frankly, the high risk factor for this technology? That is called for Microsoft, our ether board, our AI ethics board, and there are several committees within it. And again, it runs as giving guidance to the field, to our field workers on the most current understanding of AI and of our the maturity of our own portfolio. Beyond that, we have specific tools for our engineers, particularly the engineers that are building this technology. And so we've been focused on tools, tools like interpret machine learning or interpret ML. That's a toolkit that helps developers and data scientists understand the, the sort of their model behavior and provide explanations to business stakeholders and customers about what's in the algorithmic model. It's a language that has to be translated to people outside of tech. We've got something called Fair Learn, which is another capability that allows developers and data scientists to leverage specialized algorithms just to ensure that their outcomes are fair. So they actually test the fairness of the outcome of the algorithm was something we call fair learn. And then a whole study, a methodology called error analysis, which is an, making it easier for data scientists to identify co co cohorts, excuse me, of higher error rates within their results and, and matching those, those cohorts to other benchmarks to improve the accuracy of their models. These are all tool-based ways that we look at trying to understand and improve the ethics and the outcome, if you will, of the technology we serve. So I think the takeaway here is, and Microsoft, I'd like to think we are unique, but in effect, all big tech, all tech companies have to think of an interdisciplinary way to infuse principles and practices into the way they develop and deploy technology. They've got to then make sure it's disseminated across their whole organization that they're using tools that further their understanding of where error and, and, and bias is introduced and not presume that, the, the, quite frankly, you have to continually examine your own assumptions and put ego at the bottom of the scale to make sure that we're constantly checking to, to ensure the outcome is in fact as fair as it can be given the maturity of the technology we're using. So it's really been across these different dimensions that I've been spending my time with our engineers, making sure that we're just getting better, better and better in understanding where we've got gaps in our tech. Thank you, Tony. And that really leads to my next question and reflection that common to technologists, perhaps particularly among those with the quote, best intentions, there has historically been a techno utopianism, imagining not only that technologies will have great positive outcomes, but more importantly, imagining that we live in a world populated by benevolent actors. As tech companies create these tools that are used to make more and more decisions for and about people, how is Microsoft working to replace that rose colored view with an understanding that technologies are designed by individuals in societies structured by deep-seated inequalities that shape every aspect of the process. 
it, again, another solid question around this issue of um, sort of the story we tell ourselves in tech, uh, this utopianism that, that can absolutely be pervasive in the industry. You know, despite best intention, there's often a gap in businesses between the desire to act ethically and following through on those good intentions. I think the World Economic Forum describes this as the intention action gap. And closing this gap is, is ensuring that technology is developed again in more responsible, inclusive manner. For us, uh, we just actually, uh, the World Economic Forum recently embarked on a project to sort of unearth tools and processes and lessons from organizations that have made some progress in operationalizing ethics and tech. And when we studied Microsoft's journey, when they studied Microsoft's journey, there were a couple of key findings I might mention here in terms of the evolution of our company culture and the tools and processes we've been creating, and, and quite frankly, the efficacy of, of both sets of efforts. First, maybe surprising to some, before you get to tool sets and uh, specific processes and methodologies, comes this conversation of culture that responsible innovation in a company begins with culture change. Authentic and accountable technology begins with culture change. So when Satya Nadella became CEO of Microsoft in 2014, he brought forward to the company a culture shift that has been documented as one, from a scale perspective, one of the far sweeping culture shifts in tech over the last decade. And it was the use of Carol Dweck's work at, at Stanford on growth mindset. It basically set, stated the thesis that moving from a know-it-all culture to a learn-it-all culture, that we would distinguish curiosity as our core competency, that that was critical for the building of tech, for the deployment of tech, and quite frankly, the growing of a company. And I'll, as somebody who joined Microsoft in 2015, and I've been there for the last six and a half years of this culture change, I will say to you, this has been Tangible, tangibly one of the root causes for our ongoing curiosity, our willingness to challenge ourselves and others, as we have done on issues of privacy, on who owns the data, on issues of intellectual property. All of that has come from this culture shift that says, I want to learn more. I'm gonna stay on a learning journey. I'm gonna to continue to examine my own assumptions. I'm gonna examine our collective assumptions. I need to learn more and more. Now, I would argue that it's because of the learning culture that when you're going down this path of ethics and tech, you're gonna hit walls. One of the walls we hit in 2016 was quite frankly, uh, our own um, AI powered chatbot on Twitter that was called Tay, if you remember Tay. Tay was maliciously attacked to respond with deeply inappropriate, offensive, vulgar, denigrating comments about African-Americans, okay? Tay became something that we were studying to understand AI chatbot technology, and it was immediately became the, the bellwether for what can go wrong in that space. And after issuing an apology, it was interesting that the very next step for Microsoft was the creation of the responsible AI principles that I mentioned earlier that set of foundational principles that then drove to practices and now is disseminated across the operating model of Microsoft. But it came from a tough moment for the company, a tough moment for our CEO, where, at, where through experimentation with AI technology, we quite frankly learned how quickly it could be, um, it could be uh, attacked, change shifted and have huge negative effects on, on a community or population. So I think it's important to start with a growth mindset. You cannot have a fixed mindset in tech and start talking about finding the intersection of ethics or civics and technology. If you are focused on the tech, the innovation, the feature uh, function, the form factor, if that is your only focus and you are not willing to open with peripheral vision, you will absolutely build tech that could have some very, very negative impacts and not even consider your own accountability as a company. The other, I mentioned some of the tools and techniques, and there are many tools that are being built to understand more and more about bias and intentional design, human-centered design. You know, you have to start with the human as the center of your design construct in technology, and that will take you to some new solutions and capabilities that allow you to challenge, again, your basic assumptions of what you're building, as well as how it will be deployed, and to change the behaviors and the teams, if you will, and as they th think sort of ethically about 
uh, about what they're building together. You know, finally, I, I guess I would also say that, you know, you have to think about, we have found ourselves, it's interesting, my background, as, as, as was indicated early on, was at, in, the, uh, in the School of Public and International Affairs and, and Economics. I didn't come to technology as a technologist. I was at Princeton doing work on uh, things like multiplier effects in communities and, and macro and microeconomic theories. And so when I came into tech, it was all about modeling. I was using my modeling capability, running regression analyses against scatter plots of information is where I started to leverage that background into tech. And I think it's really important that we understand that technologists are not just pure technologists. In tech today is the expectation of public policy, that we are thinking about the implications on policy. The acknowledgement that tech is moving faster than the rule of law. The fact that technology is moving faster than good program evaluation and policy formulation. And so the implications of tech is that we find ourselves on the cusp of decision-making that feels like it's outside of the wheelhouse of what many were prepared to do. So we've had to kind of take that head on. We've started AI for Good initiatives at Microsoft that, that start to talk about how can tech be used to have a positive impact and really affect pub public policy. We've done this, you know, quite frankly, even before the pandemic sent and starting to put dollars behind researchers and organizations that can improve how technology is used to affect a broader set of individuals. So healthcare has been one, AI for Health, you may have heard about $40 million investment where we've just been focusing on social determinants of health, medical research, our understanding of mortality and longevity, all of our understanding of how zip code affects healthcare, that has been a big effort for Microsoft that goes way beyond the building of specific tools or solutions. Thank you, and you were just touching there on the, the range of disciplines, your own disciplinary background and how that evolved. And also earlier on the different kinds of expertise around the table. So, Thinking specifically about algorithmic discrimination, um, what's, what's the uh, importance of this diverse range of contributors to, to addressing algorithmic discrimination? How much input comes from academic partnerships? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely been found as a, a core practice for building inclusive teams that for building technology in the AI space is having inclusive teams and inclusive inputs. And inclusive inputs means going beyond the, maybe the traditional definitions of, of different kinds of developers and coders and testers and marketers to quite frankly, the academic communities as well as other parts of, of business and other, other disciplines. So we've, beyond our toolkits, we've been focused on really building a set of uh, research partners when I think about Microsoft Research as an organization, we've been working closely with Data and Society, which is an organization I'm sure you know, committed to identifying sort of the thorny issues at the intersection of tech and society. And we've sort of been providing and encouraging their research that can ground and inform us on sort of evidence-based public debates on how to build this network of researchers and practitioners who can anticipate some of the issues that we're looking at in our industry. They've been a phenomenal organization. We've also been working with the AI Now Institute at New York University, which is again, interdisciplinary research center dedicated to understanding the social implications of artificial intelligence. Uh, we're a member of Partnership on AI, which is a multi-stakeholder organization that brings together academics, researchers, civil servants, um, all forms of technologists to understand how they can utilize AI technology and understand the impacts on different groups, if you will. And we've also been supporting some student work on responsible AI. We, uh, we have the Ada Lovelace Fellowship and some PhD fellowships where we're continuing in our sort of research tradition to just pro provide promising doctoral students and studies, if you will, uh, across North America with just funding to support basic research, advanced research on the effect of AI on social equity, on different groups, on mental and emotional health, on social dilemma. So it's a combination, uh, Professor Benjamin, of what we do in societies that exist or trade associations that exist as well as direct support 
for PhD students, for PhD programs, for basic research programs across the US. Thank you. And so in terms of that, those being many of the inputs, once you have that range of expertise and knowledge and experience, what's the deliberative process that occurs when considering the development of any given AI tool? Right, no, that's fair. So if you think about it, ours breaks down in a sort of a triumvirate. First, we have our ethics committee that I've mentioned that I'm, I have been a part of for a couple of years here at Microsoft called Ether, which is really around providing the scientific and engineering advice and expertise on how an AI solution, whether an AI solution should be developed or deployed. We have our Office of Responsible AI, which is all around policy governance and sort of creating standards for sensitive use. You know, one of the things that they considered is sort of what we call the tech warranty. The, should you warranty technology so that you could almost have a scope of what is perceived as and what is in effect the proper use of technology versus the improper use of technology and make that transparent to the users. Um, we also have our RAISE group, which, are, which we call our responsible AI strategies for engineers themselves, helping engineers build with more AI print, um, sort of ethical principles in their build. So first you kind of hit it with policy, with tech deployment and with the build of tech. And that has been pretty important for us to bring those three together. In the ether process, just one example, um, when I mentioned on a weekly basis, it's case study driven when we start doing guidance on actual decision-making. You said, what are the tangible steps? We will do the research and, and against our framework, we will ask ourselves a set of questions around the maturity of the tech that's being proposed, the organization that's proposing to deliver that technology, the surrounding environment, uh, meaning how will it impact the, the users or the, if you will, the, the target audience for that technology? What do we know about the historical pattern of this technology? Uh, with this with this group or with this target audience? What's the newest in policy and, and regulatory and or legal framework that affects? So we take all of these as decision-making, sort of a decision model, and we go through specific cases. One that I had uh, back in 2018 when I first joined the committee was, was a local California police department that had requested that we use facial recognition on body-worn cameras and dash cams in, in the patrol scenarios. At that time, the technology they were requesting was too immature. It was immature not only in the obvious areas of racial bias, uh, racial, uh, the ability to detect racial differences and, and some of that bias, it was immature in many other ways. It had too many error rates. And so the decision at that time was to not provide that capability, not offer and to offer up some more mature technology that wasn't completely what they were looking for, but was a partial solution given our concerns about the tech. So Dr. Benjamin, when we, the, the deliberative process is just that. It's a, it's a framework, a decision, set of decision uh, making, if you will, steps that are based on questions and sort of a Socratic type method of questioning and getting to a collective vote from multiple disciplines in the room. And, and literally not just a single majority, but sort of a five finger vote on where we feel most comfortable about where the technology can and should be deployed. And that's been the deliberative process that now is being distributed, not only with a small committee, as I've said, that's where you start. It's gotta be distributed now with tools. We've tooled some of that so that we can train our own teams that are in the field that have to make these decisions real time in a much faster pace. Thank you. And perhaps when we open things up, we can we can talk a little bit more about that um, specific example of the California law enforcement. But in, uh, you know, zooming the lens out a bit in response uh, to widespread public demand, as you mentioned, many tech companies are putting significant effort into collaborating to set standards for development of emerging technologies to broadly agree on best practices and think about hazards in advance. But there's always been this kind of wild, wild west, boundary-free environment for tech development that some people assume is necessary for innovation to flourish. What would you say is the role of government against this backdrop? Well, you know, it's interesting, uh, Professor Benjamin, when you think about 
I sit with both government and, if you will, uh, the largest banks on Wall Street in my portfolio with some of the most um, you know, innovative pharmaceutical efforts in our health and life sciences space, as well as our state and local government business. So I sort of sit at that intersection of the role of government, in, the role of regulatory uh, action as it relates to tech. You know, I, I think one of the things we have to acknowledge, and I can say that I know at last year's World Economic Forum, our president and general counsel, Brad Smith, he talked about how we should not wait for the tech to mature before we start to put sort of principles and ethics and rules in place in governance. And that there is a specific role that we think government has to play in regulating technology. We have we have advocated that government play a broader role, a, a more pervasive role in regulating technology. The challenge that that drives is initially, you have to understand the technology well enough to regulate. And so that's why we've been spending an amazing amount of time. I probably spend the majority of my time in educating regulators and, and government procurement officials and others, politicians on, on, on the tech and its basic capabilities, where there are issues of great concern, where the tech is immature, where that deployed technology can create a, a set of unintended consequences or very, very negative outcomes. But you have to understand the tech to regulate it. And I think part of the challenge has been that feel of wild, wild west is there haven't been enough folks in the boat, if you will, that understand the technology. And to be fair, sometimes we've we've over um, we, we've made it difficult to understand. We haven't translated uh, into sort of basic uh, common practice what the technology can and cannot do. And so that's got to be the first intersection is bringing the digital fluency up of government to be able to regulate. And I've seen it over the last 18 months uh, just because we had to, out of absolute necessity, you see a lot of technology that had already been purchased, just never had been used, that was sitting agency by agency, regulator by regulator, and they had to use it. They had to use it because of a remote everything environment. So that's the, the first piece is it's really gonna be important for us to think about how, quite frankly, government can play a larger role. And tech has to come to the table willing to open the kimono and say, here's what we build, here's the profit motive, and here's what, here's what we, how we build it. But we also have an interest, you know, I think the other, it's way, hope, way oversimplified when people assume that it's only a business context in tech. If you look at the people who go into technology, you look at where we recruit, Almost all of our recruitment and retention for talent includes purpose-driven technology. People want to know what they build is adopted, what they built is adopted, and it's actually solving a real problem in the real world. So that's that sounds like marketing, but in reality, we would lose so much talent in this field if we weren't working towards some form of standardization that we could demonstrably, demonstrably prove that we were having that impact. And so I think of some of the unique areas of responsibility for, for big tech to get beyond that wild, wild west field. One of the things I was super proud of was sort of the work we had done on the Digital Geneva Convention for cyberspace. This is again, bringing technologists together around the world to say, what is the role of determining um, it when, when cyber can be used as an offensive uh, weapon by countries around the world, and nation state attacks on civilians are, are on the rise, how would we take an old construct, construct like, the digital, uh, like the Geneva Convention and apply it in a cyber world? Who are the non-combatants? Can we agree country by country to have non-combatants in the, in the cyber attack world the way we made those same agreements after World War II? So I think the, the conversation about tech is we're evolving to understand that our role is not just the build it, the build out and deployment of innovative cool devices and solutions. But we've got a role in public policy. We've got a role in stating a point of view. We've got a role in skilling government and other um, folks, if you will, in the ecosystem on helping them understand the tech so they can regulate us and regulate us in areas that are um, uh, important and inclusive for all of the citizenry that they represent. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. And I just have one more question that I'm going to turn it over to you, Tom, to see what we have coming through the Q&A. So just coming back to this interaction that you described, Tony, between tech industry and lawmakers. Lawmakers have famously embarrassed themselves, immortalized on YouTube, questioning tech CEOs. But tech CEOs have also demonstrated a very shallow understanding of the social and political dimensions of their handiwork. So while many point to the need for greater tech literacy or digital literacy among lawmakers, what do you think needs to change about the training of those in tech? That may be the, the most powerful of all questions right there, Professor Benjamin. Uh, this is absolutely a bilateral issue. This is not everybody just needs to learn digital skills. If you're in this space, you've got to understand tech as a means to an end. And I'll tell you that we have found, I come out of this world. So it's interesting how you evolve into tech. There are many roads that get you there, but sometimes there's a correlation that when you come out of a public policy or economics, or I've, I've worked at the government, I've worked at the federal government, I've worked at state and local government, that you really start to understand the frame that you're working in. You know, at Microsoft to try to help build that understanding, this is part of, first was the underlying culture shift to a growth mindset. If you've got a fixed mindset, we're just not gonna get there. You're gonna continue to get excited about the feature and function of what you built and not particularly excited about applied innovation. One of the most interesting shifts in Microsoft that I've seen over the last five years is the, the balancing of build innovation, which is a huge celebratory moment at Microsoft when we build cool stuff, but applied innovation, that equal celebration when the innovation is applied in a manner that is um, impactful and that addresses fundamental issues. So we've really gone in this digital leadership from having to explain what we build to starting to think about how we build, how inclusive is it, how transparent is it, does it respect privacy, and then for whom we build, how, how does the effect of that top technology affect audiences, whether it's marginalized people, people of color, uh, people in different industries and sectors, frontline workers, back office knowledge workers, what's the effect of the technology transformation on humans? That's been, if you will, the evolving digital leadership frame that's affected not only Microsoft, but I think almost every major tech company on the planet is thinking through these. And for us, it's been growth mindset as a culture. About three years in the US, three, two years ago in the United States team that I am on, we started to focus on this construct of empathy. And to learn that, we actually kind of all traveled down to Alabama and spent some time with Brian Stevenson way before he became uh, very cool and, and, and a rock star in his movie, uh, uh, Just Mercy. But way before that, we spent some time with him understanding empathy in action. And he helped us to understand proximity, the role of proximity in empathy, the role of hope in empathy, um, the fact that we have to change a narrative and that the tech narrative has to we have to hold ourselves accountable for the narrative we're landing in tech, not just the product set we're landing in tech. We then started to focus on what does an industry need? What does healthcare need? What does financial services need? What does the automotive industry need? And then most recently, what I'm probably most proud of is this conversation around social impact selling. I, I lead a set of, of individuals that, that deliver technology solutions to almost every sector that we've mentioned and, and even beyond that. But we've been training with what we with the Global Good Fund, which is an amazing startup, global startup that are all about social um, sort of purpose driven startups. And we've been learning from them. How do you understand the technology you're delivering with social impact? How do you sell or land technology with social impact? How do you start with the impact you're trying to drive and move back? And so we've been, I've had a cohort of folks from my organization going through this training and certification, and it's opening our eyes to to really this conversation of mission and margin. If you sell to the mission, if you will, the more we sell to the mission, we're seeing a correlation of the margin, if you will, our net margins grow. So it is profitable to be purposeful. And, and instead of questioning that, we're actually testing that. And as we test it, we're finding the higher the correlation of purposeful and profitable so that we can meet 
a range of, uh, of expectations, our stakeholders, our shareholders, and our employees. And this, I think, quite frankly, is going to be the new path, this intersection of tech and civics, technology and social impact. I call it civic tech. There's lots of words for it, purpose-driven tech. It's going beyond marketing to very tangible ways that organizations like Microsoft set up. And this is going to be our responsibility, not what we're asking everyone else to learn, what we have to learn about the implications of the decisions and the deployments that we make. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. I'm going to turn things over to Tom, who's going to see if we have any uh, questions coming in. Hey, thanks. Thanks, mm -hmm. Professor Benjamin. Uh, yeah, we have a slew of questions that I think boil down to maybe three uh, or four different areas. So let me start with this one. Uh, Tony, you mentioned the, the Ether Committee. And you mentioned that other large tech companies are, are trying to do similar things, take similar approaches, but a lot of the innovation in AI happens in small startups. Uh, what advice might you give to, to small groups, maybe not so uh, deeply resourced or as large to uh, uh, take uh, uh, or to, to have deliberative processes and, and, and think responsibly about the development of their uh, prototypes? I love this. We're, we're actually, what it speaks to is the need to kind of open source this conversation around frameworks that we've built. In fact, I've been really excited that over the last few years, the frameworks that we've built have been now adopted by the Home Office in the UK, is using it for parliamentary procedures. We've got the Department of Defense, U, uh, the US Department of Defense, uh, using our ethical frameworks on their decision-making criteria. And so let, getting beyond it being a Microsoft product, this is this is a, a way of thinking that we would suggest is not one that needs to be proprietary. And so we've got a partner ecosystem. We work with so many startups. We work with so many small, medium businesses and engagements. And quite frankly, we're, we're sharing that even on GitHub. If you think about our recent acquisition, GitHub is sort of the developer's um, you know, homes, homepage, if you will, for all things. And so we're starting to put that AI ethics capability in all of our different channels. So if you're a startup and you're doing it, you've got developers on GitHub, you can find that Ether framework. You can find the AI ethics framework, the decision-making, even some examples of case studies and decisions that have been made, how we got to the decision, uh, warranty conversations around technology, inductive unknowns, which is a really interesting uh, methodology around how to look around the corner when you're doing an inductive engineering process, algorithmic justice society findings on what has worked and not worked. All of that sits now in more of an open source construct in our GitHub, on our GitHub platform, as well as across our partner ecosystem. So I think it's out there and I don't wanna make this all Microsoft. I would suggest to you that our, our, our competitors and, and everything that every person or every org that's a competitor is also a partner. So our organizations, our brethren, if you will, they also are trying to make much more available their approaches to AI and ethics. But to be a startup, uh, generally a startup is connected somewhere. They've got a GitHub developer, they're, they're connected. They've got a LinkedIn X, they've got some kind of connection. We're making that capability, much, excuse me, that content much more available. Uh, and I'd be happy afterwards to drop to you, Professor Benjamin, some of the places where organizations can go. You're free of charge, just take a look, okay? Thanks, Tony. Um, uh, moving to a different question here. Uh, I think this is really more about uh, experience during the past 15 months with COVID and what your uh, insights might be. Um, there have been plenty of encouraging and discouraging news stories and people have had a, a wide variety of different personal experiences with the insight that you have obviously into all these different sectors um, that have been so key to response. Have you been more encouraged or discouraged by what you've seen? And I think this is actually really about constructive contributions or, or opportunistic actors. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, one person in particular uh, put in parens, Clearview AI. I, mean, I, I wonder if you might have a, a take on the, the, the news about them and their, their claim about contact tracing with their facial recognition. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I'll probably not comment on a unique uh, <laughs> single, single news story. There's so many of them. And if I go down that path, we'll be here another hour. But um, look, I will say that on balance, you know, I tend to live my life as a portfolio. You know, I've got five kids and seven grandkids and an eighth on the way. I'm four generation family with living parents that that are part of a kind of a monthly conversation we have that looks at how the world is changing from four generations. And I've had that benefit for the last couple of decades to be in this continuum of seeing the world as a portfolio, seeing sectors as a portfolio, and looking at time and and, and starting to acknowledge that everything really needs to be in balance. And so the question is what has been thrown out of balance over the last 18 months? And what's the new sort of construct that we see? I will tell you, I, I, I'm less inclined to do pattern matching on old and new the way, like, will we still do X from before? Like there's a sort of pattern matching, the new normal. I'm even afraid to use words like normal because the more I understand the current, I'm not sure we were that normal initially. So now I'm starting to say there's some things we're learning about how gap, the importance of gathering, a lot of great data and research on human gathering and connection. We just finished a workplace study. Microsoft did, uh, Satya announced it, I think at Cornell a few weeks ago, uh, but, but a, a workplace study on what we're learning. And, you know, we're learning that this new flavor of work, this new nature of work, that people do want connection. Is it five days a week? Not really, about two and a half to three days creates that sense of culture. You know, just learnings of what's the micro work week. Do we know what a remote everything environment means? Well, some people it's always on, they are exhausted. We're seeing a level of exhaustion that hasn't been tangibly quantified, but it's an emotional exhaustion of always being on and people not being able to disconnect. We're seeing what first and early in career individuals are so disconnected from the senior individuals of an organization, the informal ways that they could connect are not there. And so we see some real stress in that early in career group. And so what I, when I see, we are also seeing that this increase of just an explosion of the use of AI and data and data as currency. You know, as we think about currency, knowing your data, knowing who gets to def make decisions about that data, knowing what the reasoning over that data looks like has, is not going away. So when I look forward, am I encouraged? I'm encouraged because I've seen people fight through very difficult circumstances and let, I'm gonna say the soul-based uh, sort of aspiration still shine through. I've seen people in every, I've seen clinicians um, just use the data, use a chat bot for triage so that all the doctors and, and, and nurses could be attending to a human, but still connecting into that triage element and becoming almost bilingual overnight. I mean, these are folks who never used this technology before, but they knew they needed it. And so what it, what it says to me is this idea that tech is a means to an end is still going to be there. It's going to be underpinning. Data as currency is going to be there. The use of AI is going to be, it's not whether you're going to use it, it's how you're going to use it. At the same time, people want human-centered decision-making. They want human-centered values. And so I love the fact that I see both still occurring. This push through of teachers, ask every parent who was home with their kids, had no idea how to get to the right document. There were some awful moments and I'm, I'm still a certified educator myself and from a family of elementary school teachers. It was painful and yet I still saw a breakthrough. I saw fifth grade teachers redo their whole home and be, create a learning environment, a learning lab in their own kitchen. I mean, it was just phenomenal. So I'm hoping that the spirit of innovation and the reality of the responsibility of innovation are still in equilibrium. I don't see anything that suggests that we're dis, that it's in disequilibrium. I believe we're still in some kind of symbiotic state that is going to go forward. We're gonna to ask tough questions and we're gonna do our best to answer them, but I'm not as discouraged by where we are. I see bright light in the, for, in the forefront. Thanks, Tony. Um, uh, and I know that we've hit our uh, uh, a noon time now, but if you don't mind, I'd like to just squeeze in one more question. Okay. I'll go uh, real this, quick answer. Okay. Yeah, this area, I, I think it, it's students that ask these questions and I'll try to bring them together. Sure. It's really about one thing. Uh, uh, and that's about um, uh, career path. 
Mm. Uh, several years ago, Anne Marie Slaughter famously wrote about uh, struggle for women to have it all. Yeah. Uh, it seems the big career ambitions today still require the same sort of sacrifice to your work-life balance oh. as ever, whoever you are. Yeah. Uh, and, and this question is really, what is, was your experience climbing the leadership ladder uh, and particularly in the technology industry? So two quick, I, I mentioned to you, I didn't come from tech, so I came a different path. So first I want to say tech will, uh, will underpin so many industries that get digital fluency and skills that you don't have to be a comp sci major. You will use your digital capability in every industry, including higher ed. So let's not, let's not continually assume that tech sits outside. For me personally, I will say that uh, I, I appreciate my eclectic background. I appreciate speaking languages that aren't spoken generally in the corporate office. My moment in Kiswahili, speak, my background in living in, in outside of Nairobi. Um, I appreciate being a military brat. I appreciate, bring, I bring all of that. Microsoft is a full body workout for me. I bring everything. I bring raising five kids, all of that comes into the table. I did learn early on that you can have it all. You just can't have it all at the same time. So there is always a seasoning and a phasing in how you think about decision-making in your career. I would leave you with this construct. In my career, I liken it to a staircase. There have been moments of vertical and moments of horizontal. In everyone's career, you're going to have an opportunity to stretch into a role that really stretches you in every way, intellectually, uh, professionally, business acumen, it stretches you. There are going to be opportunities to horizontally apply what you've learned in another role. And if you look at my career, I have always been in, I can always go back and plot where I was, either vertical stretch or horizontal application. The key for building a career, if you want the big career, is knowing what direction you're going in and ensuring that you're always continually vary, you know, variating, uh, va providing variability in that direction. Don't stay vertical too long. Don't stay horizontal. Don't, don't try to be the smartest person at the room forever right? Because you don't take on something new and vertical, but don't be an adventure seeker that has to have the toughest job ever in humankind every six months, because you'll never apply your learning. So I would ask you to think staircase, vertical, horizontal, and each about every three to five years, I'm looking for the next direction. And that's what has sort of underpinned my path. I put it forward for you to consider for your own. Right. Thanks, Tony, and that's a, I think that's a great place for us to conclude. And my goodness, what a fantastic conversation it's been. I, I'm sorry that we're cutting it short, but uh, many thanks, Professor Benjamin, Tony, for a fantastic hour. Uh, thanks to everybody who tuned in live and sent in questions. Uh, we hope we'll have your company again uh, at future events, but for now, uh, we'll say goodbye from the Gilbert Lectures. Thanks again to everybody and uh, take care. Thanks again.